I was in my friend's bedroom. I was helping her to declutter her closet. We were surrounded by the keep piles, the donate piles, and it was time to try on the babies. She put on a black blazer, turned and looked at herself in the mirror and said, ugh. I had to ask her what I always ask, which is a very neutral, well, what do you think? Even though I was pretty sure, judging by her body language, that this was not going to be a keeper. She turned and looked at me and said, the truth is, I hate it. But you know what they say, everyone should have a black blazer, so I'm going to keep it. My jaw dropped. I looked up at the heavens. What? They say everyone should have a black blazer? Who is they? And why are we following this rule? She just sort of shrugged and said, I know, I know, but they say everyone should have a black blazer, so I'm going to keep it. And she put it right back in the closet. I could not stop thinking about that moment for weeks. I mean, I had had my fair share of black blazers. They were part of my power suits in my corporate days. But why did she keep that black blazer? And why did I? To fit in, to belong, to feel powerful, professional, to not ruffle any feathers, because they said we should. I started to think about how that black blazer might be one of many things that we wear because someone somewhere said that we should. Our closets are time capsules of these rules. They're unspoken, they're outdated, and they are ingrained in us. But when we stop to think about it, it's all very mysterious, actually. Who is they? Who made these rules? Let's do a little bit of digging into history and talk about one rule we all know well. Rule number one, men don't wear skirts. Women wear skirts. That's the rule. But men have started showing up on the red carpet and on magazine covers wearing gasp skirts. They are breaking a rule. But where does this rule come from? Men have actually worn skirts since the beginning of humankind. They're easy to make, light and airy in hot climates. They're practical. It wasn't until horses were domesticated in Central Asia in 3000 BCE that pants became a more practical choice. It's a lot easier to ride a horse wearing a pair of pants than it is in a skirt. So horses became a symbol of power, and so pants became a symbol of power, of access, class, gender. Power dynamics at the time dictated that, that Power dynamics at the time dictated that women didn't ride horses. So, power dynamics at the time dictated that women didn't wear pants. And if they did ride a horse, they better do it riding awkwardly side-saddled in their skirt. So, the, pa the patriarchy sends the message that pants mean power. So, men, not skirts. That's an unspoken rule that lives in practically every man's closet. But when you stop to think about it, it seems like a pretty smart choice, right? I mean, I'm going to take a wild guess that the men on that red carpet on, on the magazine shoot did not need to ride a horse to that event. So why the heck did they need to wear pants? Let's tackle another rule that we all take for granted. Rule number two, brides wear white. Brides, at least in Western culture, must wear white. Really? Said who? This rule li likely dates back about 2,000 years ago to the Roman Empire, when brides wore white tunics. White represented purity and chastity and was a nod to Vesta, the Roman goddess of home, hearth, and family. Women, white went out of fashion after the Roman Empire, and women instead wore their best dress because it wasn't a practical choice to wear white at a time when it wasn't easy to wash clothes. Enter a royal wedding. In 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert wearing a white gown, and the gown was featured in publications around the world. Women wanted to copy the fashionable queen, and suddenly white became a symbol of wealth and status. Why was white in particular a symbol of wealth? Well, if you wore white, that, mean that, you, that meant that you were wealthy enough to get married in a clean place versus the mucky environment so common in the Industrial Age. Fast forward to today, and even the most progressive women I know, including myself, proudly wear their white down the aisle. 
But why? Why do we still follow this rule? We do it because of deep cultural conditioning. We do it because it's a tradition. But do we want to continue to follow a rule that is based on women being pure, chaste, and ideally following the model of European royalty? Is that who we are? Is that what we still want? Let's take one more rule where we're starting to see an outdated rule become outdated in real time. Rule number three, women should wear high heels. Ah, the high heels. It was actually men who wore high heels as a status symbol in the old days. We've all seen those images of men in their wigs and makeup and tights and, yes, skirts and heels. It wasn't until the Enlightenment that men decided that heels were frivolous and irrational, so they should be worn by women who are frivolous and irrational. Contrary to popular belief, heels at that time were not designed to make a woman look taller. They were designed to make them look smaller. The heel itself was hidden under these long, full, billowy skirts, but they wanted a tiny pointy heel to stick out from underneath to give the appearance of the woman looking smaller. Now, that's, uh, they wanted the appearance of the woman looking smaller. Now, those days of the billowy skirts are over, but I remember all too well my years of wearing those pointy heels. Before I started my business, I had a 20-year career working in corporate and academia, and those pointy heels were part of my power suit. I remember wearing my comfortable sneakers on my long commute, only to sit at my desk and begrudgingly take those sneakers off and put on my soul-sucking heels. And I would take those heels off under my desk every chance I got. But looking back, I see more clearly what was at play. Just 12 years ago, I was working in an Ivy League institution, wearing that daily power uniform of the heels and the blazers. We had a revolving door of vice deans come and go, always men. One new vice dean called an all-staff meeting and said effective immediately, all women were required to wear pantyhose and could not have bare shoulders. They must wear a cardigan or a blazer, prompting many male supervisors to Google what the heck a cardigan was so that they could have that awkward conversation with their female reports. Oh, and by the way, any work-at-home arrangements that several new mothers had were null and void, effective immediately. It became abundantly clear to me and many of my female coworkers that this was about a lot more than a dress code. We and the, me and the women in that room suddenly found ourselves with a lot less power and a lot more cardigans. Women today, new generations of women, can't fathom spending an entire workday in uncomfortable heels. They are trading in the heels and the rules for heels, for clothes and rules that work for them. So at this point, you might be staring at me and thinking, okay, Amanda, I've got the black blazer. Maybe you're even wearing one right now. I've got the closet full of pants. I wore the white. What now? I am right there with you. I've got the blazers. I've got the heels, some of them pointy. I wore the white. The difference is that I am waking up to it. I am starting to learn how these rules masked as traditions, where they came from. And I'm starting to see all the times that I blindly followed these rules, even as a kid, especially as a kid. I remember one particular moment really well. We had just moved to a new town, and I was waiting at the bus stop for my first day of school at a new school, new town, waiting for fifth grade. All of a sudden, out of my peripheral vision, I see my new, cooler, older neighbor, John, come running at me, saying, you can't go like that. And I looked down and said, go like what? What are you talking about? You have to roll your jeans. Roll my jeans? He says, yes, here we roll our jeans. So I knelt down and rolled my jeans, and he only got more frustrated. Oh, forget it, not like that, I'll just do it. And he leaned down and did some sort of complicated fold and roll. And there I found myself on my first day at a new school with baggy jeans ridiculously folded tightly at the bottom. Sure enough, I got to school and everybody had their jeans rolled the exact same way. Phew, crisis averted. 
until I realized that all the girls were wearing the same exact trendy sneaker. Ugh, it never ends. All of this is to say in that is that all of this is to say that in many ways we're all sort of sleepwalking through life with this middle school mentality. We're trying to fit in, to belong, to not ruffle any feathers, to do what they say we should. But is that what we want? This is a time of great upheaval in our society and there is a lot at stake. We are reclaiming our power. Whether it's men on and off the red carpet wearing skirts or women ditching that infamous black blazer or the heels for more comfortable, less restrictive clothing. Or not even identifying as a man or a woman at all. We are answering a call inside of ourselves, not from some mysterious they that is basically just the patriarchy in disguise. I want to challenge us to dig deeper. I want us to ask, who is they? And why are they dictating what I put on my body, on my feet, and what I wear down the aisle? Let's all go back in time to that disheveled room where I was helping my friend. Instead of just collectively shrugging and putting that black blazer back in the closet because they said we should, I invite you to lean into the discomfort. I invite you to question that mysterious they and start thinking about how you can ruffle some feathers. Heck, Maybe you keep the black blazer, maybe you wear the white, but you do it because you love it. But can you somehow start to create some signals to those rule makers that you're onto them and you're snapping out of it? I'm going to start ruffling some feathers. Will you? Thank you. <laughs>